particularly thanks to Adam for really taking off most of the things I'm going to talk about in my slide set. So, five pounds later, yeah? Um, we're, back, we're back to the normal chat, aren't we? So, um, consciousness lunch time, so I'm just going to start it off with just something a bit different and just reset the scene of why we're talking about this and why it's important. Our natural environment, our most precious resource. Increasingly under threat as freshwater and marine ecosystems are being contaminated by wastewater spills. These spills, together with our beaches, rivers, lakes and natural waterways, are being polluted as a result of blocked and collapsed sewers are causing public outcry, demanding immediate action to be taken. But why is this happening? Utilities often have poor visibility of their network as traditional remote monitoring equipment is typically expensive and, as a result, only cover crucial points. This, together with outdated infrastructure that are often failing, means the responses to wastewater spills typically becomes a reactionary approach. As utilities are having to manage their large-scale networks without having the accurate, up-to-date data about the volumes in their network at any given time, therefore, they're unable to predict manage and prevent spills occurring. Blockages in collapsed sewers often go undetected, with severe weather events worsening the situation. Control rooms become inundated with high-level alarms during these wet weather events due to the impact of rainfall on wastewater network levels. This is proving an enormous challenge and a new way forward is needed. Introducing art, analytical remote telemetry. Our intelligent machine learning and data analytics platform, ART, forms part of a powerful data network management system that helps you to proactively manage your network as it delivers full network visibility, performance and forecasting. So how does ART work? ART uses predictive analytics that is data-driven and automated to deliver operational intelligence at every level in your wastewater network. It thereby helps you to proactively manage your network as you get full visibility at your fingertips. Our analytics platform intelligently senses any changing conditions and lets you know in advance, thereby giving you the one thing money can't buy, time to act. Blockages in the network form over time, caused by debris in the network, including fat, wet wipes and fat bugs, leading to wastewater spills. With art, you gain real insight to detect blockages as they form giving you time to proactively clear these and prevent spills before they happen. Another major cause of spills is significant rainwater, which, when combined with current wastewater levels in the network, also contribute to spills in unnatural waterways. ART combines wastewater level and rainfall data to provide intelligent alarms that highlight those high-risk areas within your network that allows proactive management to reduce the likelihood of potential spills. So, as you can see, not only does ART help you to manage your network more intelligently, reduce operational cost and meet regulatory compliance, but most importantly, it delivers environmental compliance by eliminating wastewater spills to prevent pollution, thereby protecting and saving our natural environment. ART, analytical remote telemetry, the intelligent way forward to help create a better, greener world for everyone. Right, so I think that's reset the scene quite nicely. So I think how we're going to break down what we're talking about now is following what Adam was actually talking about today in terms of how, how the different layers of solutions have to fit together and why they're important and how the openness of those structures should be important. Something I don't really cover in there that actually Adam raised is really interesting is how do you get the quad ensured data quality from the sensor right the way through. The installation aspect of that is really important and understanding that as a full stack process in terms of how the feedback moves through that process as much as the data is something that actually I think we need to get a lot better as an industry. So we'll talk about how that could be improved and move forward. So this, this slide is just refreshing some of the points that were made and certainly the video there. Again, just getting something ready for lunch. So in terms for us, Actually, we've talked about what that means for us. So this was an approach saying we're looking at rescaling the visibility of the networks here. As someone who's been operating in this space uh, for, for many, many years now, I'm talking about visibility being driven by specific blind spots and really being reactionary, saying actually we just need to provide this data to the regulators. 
that's the only reason we do it. It's to move forward. Not only is the public kind of perception has changed, the regulatory the process has changed, but also the ability to do things, the willingness to do things, has, has created a real melting pot in this space of the industry at the moment. So what does this mean to us? So we, we decided to start up from, from a ground up process looking at integrated sensor technology, utilising IoT tech and actually things that really weren't available to be done until the last couple of years and looking at how we can drive change in this particular space of the industry, working with others as well as doing things kind of in our own myself beliefs. So starting at the device layer, certainly one of the one of the barriers to kind of moving this forward over the years has been the physical cost of deploying devices at each of these locations. Particularly we have complexity of installation and the actual training required for the installation crews to get this right first time. As soon as someone's going to go back to site to rectify something, you've actually lost any cost benefit you might have got quite quickly. So what this meant for us? Actually thinking about when we were designing the solutions, designing the devices, actually thinking about how they're used. We integrate, we used field crews, we used clients as part of our design philosophy and workshopping on this to ensure that we did, when we got to market, the solution was ready and actually would work in that kind of environment. And, and actually the benefit case became a bit self-fulfilling. And really the, that kind of five minute install that you'll hear kind of some of the other guys talk about from our kit and this is the and this has been validated by external installers is actually its simplicity, but it also then comes down to health and safety. We're reducing the amount of time these guys are at risk in the field, as well as actually enabling the mass deployment processes to really move forward. And you have to think much more about just your piece of the puzzle in that one. That's really from the installers right the way through to how they interact with the device, how they install the device. Actually, how do you ensure that that installation is accurate and you can then retrospectively go and change things where you want to, or you've got a change in philosophy in your approach. So moving forward into historically probably the the core bit of the business, which actually for us has been actually that device management layer. So historically for 40 years, we've actually been a regional telemetry provider looking at that wide area complex control of assets. How do we take that knowledge and capability, ensuring that actually the layer that OT systems don't do, historically haven't done particularly well, which is they're great at absorbing lots and lots of data and funneling it into places where you can utilize it, but retrospectively going down and changing things in the device is something that actually they've fallen slightly foul of. So this is it's kind of where we've stepped in and used our historical knowledge. Accepting that actually the move to the cloud has enabled another further change in this in terms of actually getting scale of systems, getting scale of systems on localized deployments has been challenging for a number of reasons, not only cost, but actually in terms of the flexibility how you can do and change things, it, it makes a really big difference. But that's not how people tend to interact with the system. So we then started talking about earlier on about how mass deployments, what's the impact of that? You can see the sheer clustering of devices on here. That's great for managing loads and loads of devices in terms of how you can interact with them. But the last thing we want to do is have the control rooms flooded with data points and alarms. They already can't handle when they're talking about hundreds and a thousand deployments. When you're talking about tens of thousands of deployments, there has to be a better way of managing that. A bit later on, we'll talk about actually kind of data size and actually how we have to work hand in hand with them. Our other partners in the industry, whether they actually were currently working with them or not, that's an ongoing requirement, and this is why. So for us, in terms of when you start looking at that correlated data piece, you're looking at integrated rainfall. So actually what impact is rainfall forecast to have on the assets within the network? And really, as I mentioned in the video, we're looking at giving predictions of time to failure, time to act, rather than actually retrospectively reporting on something, and it's that prediction kind of time that becomes ever important. Now obviously as you get closer to the window of the event, the prediction ratio increases, and certainty factor increases as you get realised data rather than just a prediction. So what you're looking at here is kind of the options of normal operations of the screen, your dry and wet weather alarms, and these are really important because when you've got that sheer volume of data coming in, you can't have false alarms, false positives, false negatives just coming in because that just diverts crews and activity from where they need to be. But actually one of the real important things in terms of prediction is identifying building problems. Adam talked about this earlier in his, in his slots about what type of data, what granularity of data you need to be able to identify these issues building in the network rather than just going back to them to remedy them after they've happened. And that's where you get the quality of data reports rather than just having switches in the network. So there are still some challenges and balances that need to be met in terms of how we do this. That all comes together for us into, into that kind of stack-based solution. One of the things I'll talk about shortly is actually that everyone, every supplier, most certainly most suppliers in the room will talk about they can do everything. They'll do a sensor, they'll do a data piece, they'll do a transfer, they'll do this, this and this. And it's like, well, Yes, they probably can do, and, and they are right. Move on to that rather than just talk about it. That they are right to have that kind of approach. That's absolutely the right thing to do. It drives innovation. It drives actually these guys have the knowledge in terms of how their kit is used, why they've developed it. So there is definitely some learnings in there. 
where we where the overlapping lines are actually where we work together and how we transition that bit of information learnings and benefit across that will help us always move forward. And there's certainly been instances where each of the kind of suppliers do do kind of stack on their own and move forwards, but actually that will that we know that will change over time and that becomes about interfacing how we work together. The commentary earlier about procurement, kind of putting barriers in the places we have really got to overcome because it can be set up early in the scheme. And now it gets broken down and it becomes about price. What gets whittled off the deliverables is the things that actually require time and effort to do so. Integration becomes a big challenge. So what, what's next? What does this mean? So for, for me, I break this down into two areas. I think the technology really exists today. That there are not technological barriers in terms of deploying what we need to do today in AMPSEV in the UK, what's being talked about the environment bill, the pollution reduction plans, and AMP8. The technology exists definitions of how and choices of how we're going to use that technology to give us what we want and what we need at the most cost effective rate is something that's a big battle to come over the next couple of years and I think that's going to be a really interesting space to watch. One of the things we've talked about with certain kind of partners of ours is capacity utilisation. How can you create headroom in the networks to allow for storms to move through and come through? Control philosophies, some of the conversation about is there enough controllable assets in the networks? probably are, and they've never had control philosophy applied to them, or they're not allowed to have control over the sites. That's a trust issue for me, and we have to get down to kind of changing the mentality of that. We look at kind of the operational models of the utilities changing in terms of personnel and technology, and that's going to be one of the key things that really needs to change. I'll come on to open and close data a little bit more in a second, so I'll leave that one. One of the big debates things going through at the moment is, I want to talk about having zero spills. Is zero spills a reality, and poss even possible, within the climate conditions we're currently sat in. A lot of the utilities we're talking to at the moment are saying that they don't believe it is, particularly based on climate change, but with the target being zero pollution of spills instead. I mean, that has a really interesting flip angle on the environment out of the conversations on that. And we start looking at indicative measurements saying there's been a spill rather than just coming through as a storm water thing. And then do you just save the high quality measurement pieces for the, the critical areas where you need them within the networks? And I've mentioned the kind of legislation change that are coming through there. But the really big challenge that we've been hired to already today, we've all got to do this. These are our silos, these are silos within our own companies, these are silos particularly in the utilities. I've had conversations while we've been at this show this week about, oh, well, we've started doing this, and I found out this other division of the utility are doing this, but it came through this central platform of kind of, we're now trying to aggregate the solutions to make sure there's not a duplication, but actually that data can be more widely utilised within the organisation. That's, they're the kind of conversations that haven't really started to happen. The, the, the kind of the departments have kind of said, well, actually, we're under pressure to get something done here. This, this part of the company, that are, they're protecting us, they're trying to get us to do the right thing, but they're stopping us. Let's, we need to go and do something under those pressure. And, and they went and did it, and, and then there's a bit that comes afterwards, which is, how do we, how do we wrap this, this back into the reporting and data packages, which is always harder to go back and remedy afterwards. And it's really encouraging that those conversations are starting to happen up front, and I think some of the kind of uh, central data repositories, the IoT space, is really enabling some of that to be much easier than it used to be. But it's all of our responsibilities to make sure that this happens up front, across supply chain and through the utilities. The conversation needs to happen earlier in the process as to what that looks like. So we're not halfway through deployment and then going, oh, so we want to put it into here, can you, can you do this? And you end up well, the conversation with this. Well, that's not what your procurement contractors us to do, but if we know this is the right thing to do, how do we make that work? And that, that conversation is just starting to shift, and it'd be interesting to see the model shift in terms of how that moves towards our pay to The open data closed solutions piece. I mentioned before that everyone will have their own broad offerings and will rightly be trying to offer them into the market, and will do so successfully, I think, generally. But understanding and the ability to learn to play properly with others Sometimes it can be a bit like preschool in the industry saying that's mine, that's mine, I don't want to get this, you can't talk to them, they're my client, they're my friend. No. That's, that's changing and I think the segmentation around that space and the capability. Adam talks about emerging companies getting kind of picked up in terms of the larger ecosystem again. That will force some of that to happen, but actually ensuring that there is that constant churn of kind of innovative small companies moving through the space for, for keeps the whole industry on its toes and keeps things moving forwards. Again, it's going to be around data. Utilities are moving to data-driven organisations and data-driven structures. We have to play our part in that in terms of being open. I talked about how devices are installed, managed, maintained. There's a huge process of data within that, rather than just the ones and zeros. 
one thing that's really important on there, which is not talked about often enough yet, is the challenges of data integration across systems being around data nomenclature, data standards. I remember working on a project a couple of years ago that was looking at aggregating um, alarms across several water production sites. And these have got, let's say, a variety of equipment on those sites of different generations and different legacies. Same manufacturer's equipment that have been deployed in different ways by different teams over 20 years and had an unbelievable number of variety of alarm namings doing the same thing. Rationalising that down into a set of actually actual data is one of the huge challenges the industry has got. Because we can't afford to start again, there's not enough money to start again. So where some things like, so some companies are doing natural language programming, well walked in the right time there, Matt. Um, and how, how do you actually pull that into a centralised process of time? Say, actually we can do this and we can get some standardisation across that so we know we're talking in the same space. And actually you can start setting some library guidance to people that are coming into the process there. Again, safeguarding the future piece and making that a bit easier. I mentioned the environment, the regulatory changes coming through and I think the big thing there is we can see there's clearly going to be a big shift in focus, it's not only as our pay, but also as the regular um, the transitional spend through the green, uh, the green kind of funding. And aside from actually understanding how that impacts the regulatory spend, I mentioned earlier, so actually, do we do we need to know? Do we need to put the highest quality information we can possibly find in this hall, upstream and downstream of every single outflow into the network? Or do we need to do that at the critical points and can afford to do it to the critical points? But can we get some indicative measurement that tells us actually the same thing that there's a problem we need to go and remedy? at a majority of the sites that becomes cost effective. Uh, can that data then be filtered into the wider kind of network-based algorithms and kind of information systems that are being deployed and put together to really give us the information we need, which is we identifying problems and moving the problems upstream to actually re re remedy them at source, rather than saying, well, actually, we've got this 0.666 of a milligram at this point. Does that tell us actually anything more than actually indicative measurements do and that can be deployed at a broader scale? This isn't really, this is just a kind of personal point of view because it's not something we specifically do, but I think we've got to have that mix. And it's a reminder that there's no, there's no real silver bullet that's going to kind of solve all of this. And actually forming the kind of um, the kind of palette of options for us, kind of using our technology, would be saying actually we need to be part of that toolbox, saying actually we've got this for this and how do we integrate that. And there's, there's lots of kind of space to play in that, and that's an evolving place. We heard one of our clients talking last week that they're actually budgeting for our paid with a mass increase in technology spend without actually knowing what they're going to spend it on yet. But it's kind of one of those kind of wow moments. That's, that's a real interesting admission of actually just not, not understanding the complexity of the changes about to go through the industry and not having to tie every pound of spend to a specific scheme this far ahead. I think it's a really good message coming forward of actually what needs to be done, how much things are going to change to be able to deliver that. So that moves me kind of towards the end of the, end of the slot, so thank you very much for joining before lunch. I think there's probably hopefully still some left, but certainly around some questions if anyone wants to, wants to raise anything.